Hello YouTube, welcome back to the channel. It's nice to see some new faces here. I appreciate each and every one of you. Today's video will be delving into the mechanics of my traveling multi-mesh instancer, which is a tool for creating vast immersive forests mostly, where the trees follow the player around the map, uh, similar to my grass system, except this one comes with collision support and of course LOD uh, optimization. Uh, if you've recently subscribed, thank you, I appreciate it. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. All right, let's dive right in. Um, the main premise of the instancer is that the trees are spawned at uh, randomized X and Z positions, with the Y position being driven by your height map data. So it's much more optimal than using ray casts. Also, it doesn't require your terrain to even have a glider at all. We first instance the trees into the world, and then as you move around, the meshes get repositioned such that they're always around you, but snapped into position and stationary. Now, before I deep dive into the code, uh, let me demonstrate how this thing works. Observe. First, uh, we're going to drop in the height map texture, which I have already done, and set the height to 9, because that is the height that I have in my terrain shader. Uh, next, let's drop in the player node. This is the node that the instancer will follow. I will set the instance count to something noticeable, let's say 100 trees. Ground chunk mesh is only needed for scale data. Uh, if your ground mesh is scaled, uh, the script will grab the scale off of here and apply it to the height map texture. And that way we can make sure that the size of your height map texture matches the size of your terrain. Uh, let's leave everything else at default and uh, drop in a tree mesh. Uh, Control S, reload the scene, and here they are. Now let's increase the spacing to say, 30, uh, crank out position randomness, set the minimum scale to something really low, and increase scale randomness. We can also scale the height and width overall, like so, and uh, we can rotate the instances on all three axes. But what we really want to do is randomize the rotation, especially on the Y axis, although you can also randomize on X and Z, which is kind of cool. Next, let's switch on generate colliders, uh, increase the coverage radius to say 100, uh, this is the radius of the area surrounding the player where trees will have collisions. And um, create a collision shape down here. Uh, I'm going to go with a box shape uh, and I'm also going to make it bigger so that you can actually see it. And now let's run the scene and hopefully you guys can see the colliders moving with the trees. This is the same set of colliders throughout. They just get repositioned on every update. Now, why would I use multi-mesh over GPU particles? I hear you ask. Well, as of Godot 4.2, particle shaders don't expose the transform data of each particle. Uh, you can't tell a GD script where the individual particles are in the world, which means that you can't uh, give them colliders either. Now, multi-meshes also use hardware acceleration for rendering, but the transforms of the instances are actually handled by the CPU, and that allows you full set get access to them, so that's why. Now, let's look at the code. First, we sample the scale of the ground mesh. Uh, we'll use this to ensure that our height map image matches the scale of our terrain mesh. Then we create the multi-mesh instance 3D resource. Uh, we set it as top level because we only want it to update its position when we tell it to. Uh, then we create a new multi-mesh, uh, define its format as 3D. We set the instance amount and mesh. These are both export variables, so we can set them in the inspector. Instance rows is the square root of our instance amount. I will it will get rounded down to the nearest integer because the variable is declared as an integer. Offset is instance amount divided by the number of rows and it's rounded up or down uh, to the nearest integer. Generally, the reason for rounding values in this script is to avoid floating point precision errors, which would cause your trees to jitter. Height map, also an expert variable, is a 2D texture. Uh, it has to be the same one that you're using for your terrain displacement. In fact, in my implementation of this technique, I grab the height map directly from the variable text shader that does the uh, ground displacement. This await here is crucial. Uh, you must wait for the texture to load up, otherwise the code would continue to run and you would have no pixel data and you'd get errors. Once the texture is loaded, we're going to grab the noise image from it and also get its height and width and save them into the height and width variables because we'll need that data later. This script is attached to a 3D node, in my case it's a marker 3D, but you can use anything that inherits from node 3D. So, attach the multi-mesh to my 3D node, then we create a timer for our updates, we connect its timeout signal to the update function, and we can set the interval between updates. Mine is set to update every half a second, uh, this really depends on how fast you 
your player is moving. For me, I don't need to update more frequently than that. And then we call the first update, where we basically say, snap my instance or position to that of the player. Again, it's a snapped vector to avoid any precision issues. And distribute the meshes and restart the timer. Inside distribute meshes, we're going to iterate through our instance count to set the desired transform of each instance. First, we set the Z position to be the index of the instance. Then this line assigns a new value to the X component of the position vector. Uh, it takes the value of position Z and finds the remainder when divided by the number of rows. The percentage operator, also known as modulo, calculates the remainder of the division. And this line calculates a new value for the Z component of the position vector taking the difference between the original position Z and the newly calculated position X and dividing this difference by the number of rows. Well, in simple terms, this snippet of code takes the overall instance count, which you set, and divides it by the number of rows and builds a square patch out of them, like a square-shaped cluster of trees in our case. Why? Because the number of rows is always a square root of the instance count. Next, we're going to uh, center our patch, meaning that the patch moves by a measurement that is equal to a half of its side on both axes, and now the instancer is in the middle of the patch, more or less in the middle. Uh, in most cases, it won't be exactly in the middle because, again, we're using snapped vectors. Then we position our instance, we multiply its start position by the spacing parameter, and to it, we add the difference between the instancer node's global position on the x-axis and the remainder of the division of global position x by instance spacing, which is our spacing parameter. And we also do the same for the z component of the global position. And these two lines are really the core of this technique because they allow the redistribution of uh, x and z positions of each instance relative to the global position of the instancer node. Next, we're going to add some randomness to the position. Pause randomize is the export variable which sets the amount of x and z randomness that we want to add to each transform. This random function simply generates a pseudo-random around a certain given pair of coordinates. This is a direct translation from a noise generating shader. There's no point getting into the math of this. We first add it on one axis, then subtract on the other axis. Uh, otherwise, the Z randomness would get added on top of the uh, X randomness, causing the instances to be pushed diagonally in the same direction. So this determines the X and Z positions of our instance. Uh, we can now safely pass this data to our X and Z variables. And now we're ready to sample the height map to determine the Y position, so the elevation of our instance. For that, we're going to call this function get height map Y for each pair of X and Z, and it will return the Y component. Inside this function, we're going to get the coordinates of the pixel that we want to sample. Uh, these first two lines will offset the pixel coordinates to allow us to sample the correct pixel. Why? Because the global position of a player is relative to the uh, world origin, whereas the image that we're sampling is positioned in the same way any other 2D texture would in Godot, and that is starting from the top left corner and stretching down towards bottom right. So if a tree is here, its X and Z would be, say, 20 and 20, but the relevant pixel to sample is not here. It's actually down here somewhere. So this code snippet moves the reference point to the center of the image and ensures that we get that right. Then these four conditionals allow the instancer to continue indefinitely on both X and Z axis, even when you're outside of the uh, image bounds, because it just pushes you back to where the pixels can be found. Finally, we get the pixel color. Uh, the height map is a grayscale noise image, as you know, so it doesn't matter which color channel you sample. We're sampling red here, but green or blue would return the same value. Then we just multiply that by the height of our terrain and also by vertical scale. Although this is only relevant when your ground mesh is also vertically scaled. Page scale and V scale are taken from the scale of your ground mesh. So if it's not scaled, then it'll just be one and thus have no effect on this equation. Okay, so now we have the full origin of our transform so we can save it into a variable. Next, let's tackle scaling. Uh, we have a few parameters here, if you recall. We have minimum scale, instance width, instance height, and scale randomness. All of these parameters are export variables, so we can just read them from the inspector and save into the uh, SC uh, variable here, which is also a vector tray. Next, we have instance rotation. The base rotation is no rotation, and then we read the rotation parameter from the inspector on all three axes and save those combined rotations into a vector 3 variable called rot. So now we can finally create our final transform 3D. We call it T. Uh, we set its origin to the origin. We set its rotation basis, all three of them, uh, to our vector components. 
which effectively rotates the transform. And finally, we set the transform of this instance to T, scaled by our scale factor. Instance scaling and rotations must be applied locally, otherwise they'd be applied relative to the world origin as opposed to the instance. Okay, so this takes care of the multi-meshes, but we also want our trees to have collisions, which is kind of important, especially for trees. We will initiate the creation of colliders also in this function. That's why I have this boolean here for first update. We only want to spawn colliders once and afterwards we just reposition them as we move around. So if this is the first time we run this update, we'll generate a subset of trees which we want to have colliders. I'm doing this because I don't need all trees to have colliders. I only want those trees which I'm likely to interact with to have colliders. So we'll run through the instance transforms uh, and check the distance from the player to the instance. And if it's within a certain distance, which is also a parameter, as you remember, we'll append it to this array here called colliders to spawn. And uh, once we run through all instances, we call spawn colliders, where we will first uh, create a static body to serve as a parent for the collision shapes. We will set it as top level because we don't want it to move. We want it and its children to be stationary and we will position them on each update. We pass in the collision shape. Instance collision is another export variable of the type shape 3D, which you can use to create the shape in the inspector. Here we have another array called colliders, um, which will store our colliders. We'll run through the instance amount and for all index numbers that have a matching a number inside the colliders to spawn array, we will create a collision shape resource and add it as a child of the static body and set its shape to be the shape that we selected for it in the inspector. Otherwise, we append a null because we need the array of colliders to have the same number of items as our instance count. So now if we go back to the function of distribute meshes, uh, you'll see that if this is the first update, we generate the colliders and on all subsequent updates, we find the right collider for this instance by looking up its index inside the colliders array and then set the transform of the collider to be the same as this instance. And that is pretty much it. For LOD, uh, I have a script that builds a grid of vector three positions and for each grid point I spawn a cluster of trees as shown above and because they're separate multi-mesh instance 3D nodes you can benefit from frustum calling and you can also pass in different meshes like simpler meshes for the LODs that are further away. So here for example I have three meshes for my tree with a descending level of detail and I use them in my grid. Uh, I made these in a matter of minutes. In Blender you have this add-on called sapling tree gen uh, which you need to enable in preferences and then just shift A, uh, go to curve and uh, scroll all the way down for tree gen and uh, you have a bunch of settings and some cool presets allowing you to create cool trees in seconds and that's exactly what I did and then I decimated them via a modifier to build those lower poly uh, versions. If you don't feel like writing a script to create the chunks, you can literally just duplicate the instancer node several times and just lay them out manually. It'll be the same thing, just make sure that they have a shared parent. And this, my dear friends, is it for today. I realize that explaining code is not very entertaining usually, but I thought that people, especially people new to Godot, may get some value out of this. With that being said, let me know in the comments if you think this kind of tutorial-esque uh, content is useful, or I should just keep it at a higher level. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't, follow me on X for more regular updates, and I will see you shortly. Ciao.